Hello everyone, I'm here today to present to you ACI part 1 which is a high level overview of ACI. So I'm going to structure this video in two sections. Firstly I'm going to talk about the hardware itself that ACI resides upon and then the second part of this video I'm actually going to dive into ACI and talk about the, the unique features, benefits of ACI and what it really brings to the table and what IT challenges in today's world does it solve. So firstly to talk about the hardware. So there's two different modes of operation on the hardware that ACI can reside on and this is actually the family of the Nexus 9000. So one mode of operation on the Nexus 9000 is Enhanced Nexus. So that's pretty much the equivalent of what we run today on the Nexus 7000, Nexus 5000, 3000, etc, etc. So it includes all features like we're all familiar with like VPC, spanning tree, routing. Uh, it's pretty much a Swiss Army knife in terms of um, all the different things it can do. Like we know we can on the 7K. Now the other mode is ACI mode. So it can either run on one mode or the other, not at the same time. So it's mutually exclusive. So this is actually looking at a chassis of the Nexus 9000 family. So the Nexus 9000 family comes as either a chassis or a fixed switch. So these are the chassis and this is the medium sized chassis, this is an 8 slot one. There's also a 4 slot one and a 16 slot one. So this has the capability to provide 8 line cards here. And then it also provides the also has two supervisors here and here and then the capability to hold all these power supplies at the bottom here we'll get to line cards and the type of line cards in a minute so that's the front of the chassis here now at the back of the chassis is where all the fabric cards are so these are the fabric cards that actually provide bandwidth to the line cards at the front of the chassis. So you actually have to unscrew the fan to get to the fabric cards themselves. And what you'll notice here is the fabric cards are positioned horizontally. Sorry, vertically, I mean. <laughs> and um, the line cards here are positioned horizontally. So each fabric card actually provides just over 10 terabits of bandwidth to each line card um, simultaneously if there are many line cards running. So it will provide 10 terabits here, 10 terabits here, um, all the way down simultaneously. Now, if we had six of these fabric cards, um, installed then that will be six times the 10.24 so actually what that provisions is 61.44 terabits um, of bandwidth to the frontline card that is the maximum capability um, at the moment which is pretty high <laughs> so obviously this um, this future proofs this chassis for future line cards um, currently we're, we pretty much run on one to ten gig line one or ten gig line cards or 40 gig line cards um, but this will actually future proof it for 100 gig line cards and 400 gig line cards um, pretty cool to say the least what we've also got here is um, actually before I get to that notice as I said these are as I said earlier these are stacked vertically, these are stacked horizontally. So the pins the pins from the fabric card touch the line cards at the front. So obviously when you've got six six of them, they'll all six will connect to this line, you know, each line card. Think of it as a matrix. Um, that's how all the bandwidth is provided. So like I say, they touch directly, so in this case there's actually no mid-plane um, as, as seen from this middle middle bit here. 
that's um, that's a really great great feature for several reasons. One reason being better airflow, um, cost of costing and all that sort of thing. Another reason is okay. So imagine comparing this with the Nexus Seven Thousand. Nexus 7000, as you know, has a mid plane. Now, what hap what would happen if there was a bent pin that happened in the mid plane? You'd actually have to RMA the whole chassis back, um, which is a bit of a liability to say the least. So, um, no, hopefully it will very rarely occur that you do get a bent pin, or never, I prefer the word, <laughs> um, bent pin on the, the the line cards or the or the or the um, fabric modules however if that was the case all that would need to be is just replaced itself much better than um, um, RMAing a chassis so like I said going back to what I was originally going to say um, the redundant system controller cards are positioned here and what this allows is offloading um, of the control plane from the supervisors, so it's um, it's distributed here. So with the power supplies, you can run them in all the different modes: N plus one redundancy, uh, grid mode, combination of both. And on the actual supervisors here, you'll see the out of band management. You'll see the console ports, and then two USB ports as well um, for storage, extra storage. So talking about the line cards now, there's really two different families of line cards for chassis um, on the Nexus 9000, one for Nexus and one for ACI mode. So if you're running these in Nexus mode, I now need to get to the spine and leaf concept. So let's bring this diagram up. So what we have here is what's known as the spine leaf architecture. So if you're familiar with the core distribution and axis architecture, this is pretty much just collapsing it to two layers instead of three. So it's the spine layer, this is the leaf layer. The spine layer is the equivalent to the core layer really, um, just responsible for rooting between the leaves, nothing, nothing else really. All the intelligence happens at the leaf layer, so that's almost equivalent of access. So I will get into later the um, different the, di the different ways you can connect to the um, to connect to the leaf switch here. So between the spine and the leaf switch is 40 gig, and then um, bet between going downstream from the leaves is pretty much 1 or 10 gig. So look, just to repeat what I said, all the intelligence like for example quas, access lists, and anything like that would apply here and just kind of rooting between the leaves happens here. Now in this type of architecture it is forbidden to have interleaf connection or interspine connection. So you can't connect one leaf to another leaf, you can't connect a spine to another spine, you can only ever connect a leaf to the spine. Um, even if you tried to connect it in ACMI mode, it wouldn't let you. So going back to presentation. So in Nexus mode, it would be a 9600 in the spine, and it's not on this actual diagram, but it'll be a 9400 line card for a leaf. So typically a 9600 line card in the spine would be obviously 40 gig, and a 9400 would, yeah, and the 9400 could either be 40 gig or, or 10 gig, because obviously you need the 40 gig going up to the spine and one 10 gig line cards going down stream. So, if you're running it in ACI mode, it would be a 9700 in the spine, and likewise a 9500 in the leaf. 
and once again 9700 just run 40 gig in the future obviously we take we would um, provide 100 gig or 400 gig and the 9500 would like I say once again also be 40 gig to go upstream to 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 the spine and a 110 gig guard card to go downstream and then this is kind of reiterating you can use a 16 slot chassis uh, four slot chassis but eight is the middle one so talked about chassis there's also fixed switches that are part of the Nexus 9000 family so you can either get one that is 2RU on the left or the one in the middle that is 3RU um, they both have an uplink module here which you would position at the top of the fixed switch here so these are the 40 gig links that would go up to the spine and these links here are the 1 slash 10 gig links that would go downstream that can either be uh, SFP pluses or um, 10 G base T and it supports twin axe fiber whatever it needs to support so typically fit switches would be at the leaf and chassis would be at the spine however that doesn't necessarily have to be the case because obviously I mentioned in the previous slides um, you can have chassis in, in the leaf which run on 9500 line cards and also you can have a fixed spine which is known as a baby spine which is a 2RU high sp spine so this slide shows you all the different types of line cards that are out there and fixed switches um, currently today on the right hand side I'll talk about the APIC that will that will come in later and I'll really be talking about that in greater detail in video two of this presentation so this is once again expanding on the line card types and this is where we this is this slide really talk really emphasizing on the chipsets that go in each line card now for the 9600 and the 9400 line cards you would need to run in Nexos mode they have on them the, the Trident chipsets which are based on Merchant Silicon so these are pretty much the standard chipsets that we, we've used in the past and what competitors use as well now for ACI mode we've actually built our own in-house chipsets um, which no other competitor has or anything like it so they like I say for are for our ACI line cards so for the 9500 line cards um, they are the ale chipsets and for the 9700 it's what's known as the ASE chipsets so as you'll see on a 9700 because you've got the ASE chipset um, it's you only run ACI for the 9400 they use the tri they use the Trident chipset so depending on which type of line card it is there'll be one or two or three if it's the 9600 spine here and as you can see here um, they're just designed for Nexus for the 9500 actually you can so I'll take back what I said earlier you can actually run um, Nexus and ACI because they have on them both the Trident 2 chipsets and the ale um, in-house chipsets this once again is talking about the chipsets for the the fixed switch so apart from the one at the bottom I'll get to that in a minute they have the Trident chipsets and the AL chipsets so yes you can run both Nexus and ACI on them obviously not at the same time <laughs> And at the bottom, we have the fixed spine, which is what's known as the 9336PQ. That's the baby spine I was mentioning earlier, the only fixed switch you can use for the spine. Typically, we would recommend you use chassis, because um, obviously that will be the aggregator for all the leaves anyway, um, and all the potential line cards you'd, 
you potentially need connections to those leaves. Um, but if your scale out solution isn't necessarily going to be that big, then these might be all you need anyway. And obviously, you've got to think of future growth as well. So these just run ACI, however, they have both the ASC and Trident chipsets. So talking about scalability, so these are the marketing figures, um, what's been told it can support. So you could have it running with 12 spines and 288 leaves. Well, if you needed 288 leaves, I think you'd definitely need to use the uh, <laughs> chassis at the spine. It can provide 100,000 ports simultaneously in a whole solution, 8,000 multicast group on a per leaf basis. You could either use as IPv4 on its own or IPv6 on its own or a combination of the two, a total of 1 million endpoints, 64,000 VRFs, um, you could use 576 uh, 40 gig ports at the spine, and as I mentioned earlier, you could have slightly over, this slide doesn't do it justice, <laughs> 60 terabits capacity per spine when you've got all the line six fabric cards at the back supporting the line cards. So, getting to section two of this video now, what actually does ACI solve? As I mentioned earlier, what is its uniqueness? What does it bring to the table? And what what does it solve in today's challenges in, in the networking world? So, today's day and age, we have application guys. They're the developers to do all the programming, etc., etc. Then we got the network infrastructure guys who create all the routing, the switching, the VLANs, the quads, the access lists, etc, etc. Now, if we think about it, network connectivity is really um, for the application. Most, most of the network stuff is, is really for the, is for the application to manage the application and its needs and its requirements end-to-end, -end, its quads policies, its security, its, its everything. And what often happens is it's a completely different mindset being a programmer to a <coughs> network guy. So application developers think in terms of web app and database, um, as an example. I'll get to that in a minute. And infrastructure teams thinking, how do we make sure the net network connectivity is reliable for what needs to be carried across it, for example, the application guys. Now, what often happens is because there's a different mindset, communication between the different teams aren't aren't as great, and it can be quite inefficient sometimes in a lot of respects. So, what we thought of is a different approach. What we need is a is a program that can manage the network on the application's behalf, make configuration a lot simpler, make be smart with deploying it so you almost don't need to get two separate teams to communicate make it much easier to manage make it much easier to scale and like i say solve a lot of the challenges in in today's environment so like i say what can often happen is you get you got the network guys who have configured all their network and an application run on it once upon a time and then the application went away and because of lack of communication sometimes between the teams there's all this unintended functionality that doesn't actually need to be on the on in the network at all and this can be really challenging this can cause bottlenecks and things like that so not only do we want to sort of minimize configuration but we really want to make everything manageable so it's less likely for things to go wrong and everything can be seen and managed a lot clearly. So what is an application to the network? 
A lot of people think it's just an end server or a VM. It's not the case at all. It's actually, the application is the end-to-end -end net connectivity requirements across the whole network. So, usually an application requires a web server or multiple web servers in a cluster, an application server, multiple application servers again, and, you know, one to multiple database servers and obviously data multiple for clustering and areas like that um, if there's a huge amount of demand or a huge amount of users and things like that so a typical example as I mentioned you got a yeah as I say web app DB and a user there basically so this is the this is really the common way of how a application guy thinks and these obviously need to be connected in different areas of, of of the network as well so not only is it thinking about all the endpoints um, but it's the relationship between them as well so think of a classic example um, most of us have to purchase something and we use iProcurement or anything based on an Oracle database and we, you know, we have to purchase things through the company. So this would be us accessing it via the web and then the web server's got to talk to the application server so that's all Java based and then the application server's got to talk to the Oracle database at the end so that's a, that's a very common use case of, of this. Web app and DB are kind of the most common sort of components you use however obviously it doesn't need to necessarily be that case but throughout the remainder of this video and the second video I'm going to present um, we're going to go along this concept here so you'll probably be most of you will probably be fairly familiar if not very familiar with UCS so UCS has a, co has a concept which is known as a service profile. So without the service profile, the blades in the chassis have no intelligence. There's nothing they can do. They're just hardware. You can't actually install anything on them. Until you have that service profile attached to that, uh, sorry, associated with, these, with the hardware, then it provides it with that personality, all its attributes. For example, its MAC address, its worldwide port name, its worldwide node name, its UUID, its boot order, etc., etc. And then once that's presented to the hardware, then you can install the operating system on top of it. The operating system will then see the service profile attributes attached to that hardware. So we're kind of taking a not too dissimilar approach here actually to ACI. We're actually providing what's known as an application network profile to the fabric as and when it needs to be required. Now the great thing about ACI is maybe on a temporary basis an application needs to be deployed. Then after a few months that application is no longer required. So take it away and take away all the network connectivity with it as well so this is a great solution it just means things are a lot more manageable and easier to you know potentially troubleshoot and really take a good monitoring on and this is the approach uh, engineers have been talking about for years and it's really exciting that we can get here today um, so I can explain this so this application network profile once again we got the web app database model so what this application network profile is essentially doing is applying a network to the to the fabric for the application and that's that's simply doing it so what we have here are what's known as endpoint groups i will expand upon this in the next slide here here and here and what endpoint groups will do will classify um, commonalities between what endpoints are. So, for example, we could have a user. Let's put them in VLAN 10, and we can even 
create our own endpoint for the user. Then we could put all the all the web guys in, for example, another VLAN or VXLAN. I'll get to that in a minute or in the next video. Then we can categorize app and database and then we can set up what's known as contracts and that's how each endpoint group relates to one another. So what what protocols will can be allowed between these guys here and what protocols can be allowed between these guys here. So let's go back to the diagram here. So we've got our spine and leaf network here and then what we've attached is for example a user to a leaf and obviously you're going to need to attach web servers to the leaves application servers to the leaves and database servers to the leaf when you first configure your APIC and get them into a cluster um, first thing it will actually do is discover the leaf that it's attached to. I'll get to attachments of it later. And all this will do an auto discovery. Not only will it do an auto discovery, but it will auto provision itself with a layer 3 network. So if anything connects between here and here, um, the routing is all automatically sorted out between them as and when it needs to be sorted out so none of that intervention actually has to be done with an application probe so all the layer one to three is all sorted on itself application network profiles kind of adds the four to seven bit on that so when once we've deployed an application network profile what it will actually do is tie the users in to all the relevant components, user to talk to the web, web to talk to app, app to talk to DB. So not only will it prov automatically provision the required end-to-end -end network between all the devices and automate it, it will also provide all the firewall rules, quas policies, whatever you provide automatically via the GUI to automatically provision it for you. So. I, I, I really do think it's um, a great solution here. So this concludes video one. There's also a video for video two and you'll see this in our YouTube channel. So please do have a look at our YouTube channel and subscribe to it because there's a lot of great videos there on data center, service provider, other areas and many more to come in the future. And um, yes, uh, click on the like button for this video. Thank you.